also want to be respectful of your time and not try to um, extend this into a three-day conference. So it does, the first day is always overwhelming. Whenever we've done this, is, I've always had that. And it used to be that we would then have a dinner afterwards, and the dinner would wind up to like be completely unattended because people would intend to have gone to go, but um, by the time they got to 6 o'clock, it was just too much to go. So anyway, welcome back to the second day. And I promise it's not going to be as exhausting because it's only half a day today. Um, <laughs> My topic, the way the morning is going to run, I'll just give you the broad overview. There are three of us who are going to be presenting on topics that have more to do with the emotional ramifications of having this illness and um, coping type things. Mine is going to be mostly about anxiety and I'm, I'm going to be talking about actually Okay, my background is that I'm a clinical psychologist trained a long time ago and I haven't practiced in a long time and I always get myself suckered into these talks when there are actually people in this room that are more qualified to do it than I am, but I'm going to give it a shot talking about anxiety. And then um, Eileen is going to step up and talk specifically about caregiving um, and the stresses on caregivers and how to help manage those stressors. And then Myrna, um, who is also a clinical psychologist, but has tr transitioned to become a life coach, is going to talk to us about transitioning to acceptance. Um, and then we, I think we're going to take a break. I hope so. We'll you, know, you guys can ask us questions. It doesn't need to be as formal as yesterday. There's fewer of us, and the room is smaller. They just shout. Um, we'll take a break, come back, and then we want to talk to you for a little bit, just briefly, about the NGO Alliance. Because um, as much as People think they know about what we do. Most folks don't really have the big picture of what we do because we do a whole lot. And um, I also, <clears throat> at that point, will put in the plea for y'all to become more involved in whatever way best suits you and give you some ideas of what the opportunities are and what some of the other people, many of them in this room, have already got. Um, and then we'll break into conversation groups. And at the very end of the day, those raffle tickets that you got when you came, they're in, tucked in your name tag, or the, and especially the extra ones that you bought to increase your chances of winning our beauties, we'll be pulling um, raffle tickets and saying goodbye, and just inside, but not laughing at each other. All right, so anxiety. Um, I think when I hear from folks talk about what, um, how the bleeds have impacted them. Probably everyone, I, I can't think of anyone that I've spoken with that hasn't. That hasn't mentioned anxiety as being one of the big changes in their lives. Because it bleed happens, and then we all know, unless you, even if you've had surgery, but um, definitely if you haven't had surgery, there is always the concern of, will this happen again? Um, and their anxiety is, and let me, anxiety is common not just with cavernous angioma, and I gotta tell you, there are absolutely no statistics on how common it is with cavernous angioma. What I can tell you is, what I know is that it's like 100%. Um, but the, statistics that we do have are with stroke and anxiety for people who have stroke in general is quite high. 30% have what's considered clinically significant anxiety. So that's not just normal worry anxiety that we all have that like kind of comes and goes. That's clinically significant to the point that it disrupts life, disrupts ability to function in life. And then it seems that there is some even biological component to it. It's not just that I'm worried. It's that if you have bleeds in specific parts, that actually causes anxiety in and of itself beyond the, the just normal worry that people have. So on the left side, um, if you have your bleed on the left side, it's associated both with having a combination of anxiety and depression. And if you lose on the right side, um, it's associated more with having just anxiety. Brain stem is kind of all over, the, all over the place. And today I'm going to help 
help you um, explain sort of the different versions of anxiety going, um, there's the normal worry that we all have into some, some other buckets. And I kind of like buckets to help me understand um, how to conceptualize what's happening in my world. And there are two buckets that I'm going to talk about. One of them, you, unless you're in the mental health professions, have probably never heard of. And the other one, everybody's heard of, but may not necessarily know very well what it is. Um, so normal worry is that fear, fight, or flight response that we have. It's that feeling in the gut. Um, it's the thing that all of us, at some point in the middle of the night, wake up and we can't get our brain to stop. It's that foreboding feeling that we have that something bad is going to happen. And that's all normal. That's None of that is out of the ordinary for the extraordinary experiences that the folks in this room have had. I, if, so don't worry about being worried. Um, <laughs> because, because it's normal. If you weren't worried, that would be weird. Um, it's a matter, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about how to manage that worry so that it stays at a, man, at a level that is manageable um, and can actually uh, be reduced over time um, as you become a little bit more adapted to what your experience is and what's about to happen. My second bucket is called somatic symptom disorder. Um, it's, has anybody else in the room heard of somatic symptom disorder? And, Okay. Um, somatic symptom disorder is a diagnosis, um, and it is a diagnosis for people who actually have a physical illness that they have excessive amounts of anxiety about. Um, there's an alternative diagnosis that used to be called hypochondriasis um, that we all know about. It's sort of the Woody Allen syndrome where you imagine you have something wrong with you. It's, you're very upset and anxious about it. But this somatic symptom disorder is you actually do have something wrong with you. It's how you're managing the emotional experience of having it that becomes clinically significant and um, in many cases cause impairment. Um, oh, and the last one is PTSD. And again, you've all heard of PTSD, but I'm going to go a little bit into what it actually is. So somatic symptom disorder is somebody has one or more physical symptoms that are distressing and result in significant disruption to your family life, to your daily life. So you're sick. You've got pain. You've got um, uh, some disability. You've got uh, problems with vision. You might have some problems with speech. You've got stuff going on. However, what turns you into somebody who would be carrying a diagnosis of somatic symptom disorder is that you wind up having excessive thoughts about this or feelings or behaviors related to the symptoms to the point where the thoughts and feelings and distress become almost more um, life impairing than the symptoms themselves. Um, and so it's not, again, it's not just normal worry. It, this is something that has to have lasted at least six months. So if, if the worry and the concern has been part of your life in a way that affects your daily functioning for six months or, six months or longer, then you start to fall into this somatic symptom disorder. Um, it says they're disproportionate and persistent thoughts about how serious your symptoms are, um, and excessive time and energy devoted to your symptoms and your health concerns. And we don't mean that you're hanging out too long on the NGM Alliance Facebook groups. I mean, yeah, people can hang out too long on the NGM Alliance Facebook groups, but it, it could be more that um, you are Googling every um, little symptom that you have, that you're trying to find you know, the, the 10, 20, 30, you're consulting 10, 20, 30 specialists. Um, it's excessive. It's um, beyond what one would want to have in order to continue having a regular life in addition to having um, an illness. It can result in both anxiety and depression. And if we treat the somatic symptom disorder, then often the physical symptoms begin to get better as well. They begin become easier to manage. I've got a couple of examples of someone who has somatic symptom disorder who would qualify for the diagnosis. And then someone, my second slide would be somebody who has very similar experiences but is managing them differently. So Mary, and 
if you're on the Facebook groups, this is not anybody that is real. This is a composite of some of the folks that you may have encountered on the, brain, on, on the uh, Facebook groups. She's got a brainstem lesion and hemorrhage, and it caused um, strabismus from the six nerve involvement, so her, her eyes is really going in, and numbness on her right side. Um, and her lesion is inoperable, and she's had eye surgery. Um, she, at this point, is not completely disabled. She's not housebound. She's able to drive. Um, she could probably have some type of work that would get her out of the house. But two years after the hemorrhage, Mary is still so worried about her illness. Much of the day, every day, the lesion is still there. She's, she just um, can't manage the feelings of knowing that it's still there. She's requesting frequent routine ever MRIs pretty much every time she has an extra leg pain or um, a little bit of tingling in her foot. She's consulting Dr. Google and consulting her own doctors. Um, <clears throat> she's uh, stopped all of the activities that used to give her joy and has wound up, and, and this is unfortunately some of the folks that I've encountered over time, has wound up being almost housebound in a condition that doesn't really require her to be housebound. Um, she's unable to work. She doesn't have much quality of life. She's losing her support system because her old friends are just pulling their eyes at this point going to get over it. Um, and they don't have as much tolerance for her continued fixation. So, so that's one course that I have seen many people go as they manage their diagnosis. And it's a, it's a often it's folks that don't have a whole lot of um, things in their baggage of coping skills to start with. And so once they're challenged with something as big as this, there isn't a whole lot to draw from. Um, and it be becomes difficult for them to figure out ways to pull themselves out. So an alternative is Sue, who also has an inoperable brainstem lesion that hemorrhaged um, and causes strabismus and numbness. Um, she also spent the first six months after surgery very concerned about a possible repeat, a lot of anxiety, difficulty sleeping. She sought out a lot of doctors. She was on the Facebook groups all the time. Um, but by two years after her hemorrhage, things were different. Um, Sue had scaled, made a choice to scale back but not in her work life to accommodate the deficits, to bring a little more balance in her life. Um, and she added things in her life that, that were enjoyable to her that she might not have been doing as much before her fleet. Um, adaptive dance, this is actually some things that I know people have added. Adaptive dance, meditation, um, doing volunteer work uh, at a soup kitchen, volunteer activities for a support group they were in. Um, the illness becomes just a part and not the defining feature of who this Sue person is. And a big part of that is living in the present and not living in the future of what ifs. Um, and this Sue also has a, an enviable quality of life with family and friends, and Sue started with a lot of ability to cope with, um, with difficult situations, and she continued to be able to do that. Um, this the same person has had small hemorrhages since the original bleed, but again, every time a small hemorrhage a leak happens, she takes it and tries to rationally examine it, what's happening. How bad is it? If I'm just tingling a little bit, does that mean I'm having a major hemorrhage? Probably not. So let's just stay focused on what I need to do today in order to figure out what's going on. Um, and I can tell you, too, there is no such diagnosis as somatic symptom disorder by proxy, but there should be. Um, by proxy means if uh, you are a caregiver for someone, especially a parent, for someone who has a disorder, um, it can be tempting to overdo it and, and allow your, your child's illness in there, allow your child's illness to take over um, what the quality of life that we have, and it's difficult not to, especially especially as a parent. Um, another example of someone who's not doing it as well, 
um, because of somatic, um, somatoform symptom disorder. Um, John had surgery to remove a lesion that had been causing partial complex seizures. His driver's <coughs> license was revoked, and this is always a big deal, um, at, both for six months before and after his surgery. And he also has multiple lesions because he has a hereditary form of the illness, um, but the other lesions haven't been active. He was dismissed, and this, is, this actually is somebody close to somebody I know who's not in the room, um, was dismissed by an IT job that he had where they felt that he was taking advantage of the illness um, because they hadn't seen him seized, they didn't understand partial complex seizures. Um, he was taking probably more time off of work than he needed to for real, but that it was a combination of the job didn't get it and he also didn't quite get what he could still do. Um, he retreated to bed in television. And there are unfortunately a number of people I know where they get the diagnosis and the first thing that they do is completely shut down. And it tends to be men more than women, um, or and especially young men. Um, the men in the ages of 19 to 27, 28, who don't yet have family responsibilities. Um, they run the back at mom's house often not function very well, and it's 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 frustrating for parents. Um, John retreated to bed and we stopped interacting with friends, stopped job seeking, he applied for disability, but wasn't severely impaired enough to be approved. Um, he then started developing other physical symptoms that probably had nothing to do with the cavernous angiomas. Um, daily migraines, leg pain that was probably more psychological actually physiological, but he was getting prescriptions and wound up in um, uh, dependent on, on narcotics um, and constantly on the phone asking for more narcotics from his doctor's office, distressed about his condition, and uh, of course his wife and his parents to release the patients. Um, again, somebody who didn't necessarily have a, a plan B. Um, the job fell out, they got sick, what is the plan B? Um, that is an anxiety provoking uh, situation that can lead to a lot of bad things happening, um, or a lot of bad choices made. Mike also had the same sort of combination of things happen, and he had to give up his trucking job because he, was, um, he lost his driver's license, and the trucking company didn't have anything else for him to do, so he wound up on disability for a short period of time, but, and here's the but, he also started vocational rehab. He was able to manage the fear of the illness, able to manage um, the blow of losing his driver's license and his primary job in order to go on and learn how to do auto and truck mechanics. And he wound up um, being graduated from the program despite being somewhat fluffy from the medication, and then um, he got a job, and five years later, he wound up getting his own repair shop. So this, this is a success story of somebody who took the exact same situation and went a different direction with them. The rest of us are between the extremes, usually. Um, we don't necessarily take it and you know, turn our character's <laughs> engineering story into a successful business story, um, or necessarily turn it into the ideal work-life balance. But we try. And as I said, it's normal to worry. It's normal to focus on the illness, especially right after your diagnosis, right before your MRI, or if you are about to have a surgery. If you didn't worry those times, you would be here. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to start checking your pulse. That's the point where I would go. Um, it's a, this fight, flight, or freeze response is primitive. We all have it. We all need to figure out our ways of managing it. And when We've crossed the line, is, as I said before, is when the distress is more disabling than the illness itself, it's time to take a little look and see what's going on and how you can take care of that. Um, and if the distress continues for a very long time, and I know this is a chronic illness, but it does for everybody, it kind of has ebbs and flows. Um, and so if during the ebbs, you're still cranked up as high as you were during the worst crisis points, then it's time to start looking at what your alternative um, alternatives are for making that better. So, for all of us who are dealing with this level of anxiety because of the illness or because of a child's illness or the spouse's illness, 
can make some choices to change things, to add things, to subtract things. And I've got a list here that's not, um, it's not the full list. I'm sure you can add your own personal things. But I'll, I'm just going to hit on a few of them. Mindfulness meditation has gotten a lot of press. And it's nothing religious. It's nothing woo-woo. It's just basically learning how to keep your focus on the present and not letting your brain wander off into what's going to happen a year, two, five, ten years from now. You know, what is going to, my kid going to be doing or, or whatever. It's learning through practice to focus on, some people focus on their breath, some people focus on the sound, but always recognizing that your thoughts are going to wander and bringing them back to the present. Doing that for just five to ten minutes a day, or even not even every day, just on a somewhat regular basis, is enough to change physiology, to bring down anxiety, um, and to give you a skill of self-observation. So that when we do wind up going down that path of, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, how am I going to deal with this? It's possible to look at it and go, oh my gosh, honey, you are just catastrophizing here. Let's take a step back, take a few deep breaths, and, and kind of reason it through. For some people, a spiritual or religious practice has that same effect. And for other people, journaling will do that. If you are writing your um, thoughts out where you are in the moment, um, it can also do that. Exercise helps a lot physiologically. Um, cardio <laughs> exercise, of course, helps, um, but also stretching and balance exercises as much as you can do. Um, and I, I like Tai Chi. It involves a lot of present focus because you have to keep your body in balance in certain positions, and there are ways to modify Tai Chi depending on what your physical limitations are. And a new one that came out just in the last <coughs> few months is that anxiety can come from a messed up gut the microbe system. Um, probably all the really microbiome that's living in you, you have more bacteria cells than you do human cells in you. And there are certain foods that apparently are good at helping re-regulate your gut so that there's less anxiety. Um, and they happen to be fermented foods like pickles, sauerkraut, yogurt, which was out there this morning. Um, so just have you back there. And kimchi um, can help in <coughs> moderation, of course. Social support, and I'd like to make a differentiation between social support and social distraction. Support is people who know what you're going through, like the folks in this room, like the people on the NGM Alliance Facebook books, Facebook groups, or the community forum, um, other folks that get it. Um, that's different from social distraction, and you need both. Social distractions are people who don't get it, but keep your mind off of it. Um, they could be people that you go out with and play fun with. They could be uh, folks that you do volunteer activities with. Um, they could be people that you encounter through hobbies. But they're almost always people, um, and not just activities. They can help you to get a, a more rounded life. Um, Modifying expectations and getting help from responsibilities to the degree that you need that. Um, playing Superwoman, Superman is a great idea, and I think we all know that. And asking for help is important as long as you do what you know you actually are capable of doing. And then music and an underlying singing. Um, singing has physiological impact in reducing anxiety. Um, I, I know when I'm feeling really anxious, I'm sitting in the car, and that helps. Especially if traffic's bad, and I'm like, if you're a rage moment. <laughs> if, I, if I sing, it kind of makes it a little bit better. Um, nobody can hear me there, except my dog, and she's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, listening to the house, too. There's something about music that changes the way our brain is working. Um, doing art helps as well. Um, is yeah, doing art and one of the, the, the um, artistic endeavors that I think is most useful is photography because photography does force you to look at what is in front of you in that moment 
Um, and then you can always combine that with green time and nature. Take pictures of fungi out there if you want to, <laughs> or anything else that's appealing. Green time is important for children with ADHD. It's essential, um, and for people with anxiety, getting out in nature is really critical. Um, lowering your stress levels in general. So if you've got a job that's got you busy for 60 hours a week, even if it's um, even if you're a physician, let's say, and you are in a hospital practice, it's possible to change the kind of practice that you have in order to reduce the stress levels. I don't know any job in the world that can't be modified in some way, um, either in changing hours or in changing slightly how the job is done in order to reduce the stress levels in it. Um, and giving yourself some time. And then having rituals, um, you know, I don't know if You've often thought of this, but I, I do from time to time. There are rituals that I do that just kind of center and focus me. And I think many of us have those tea time, bath time, um, a special time to read, a special time to, to listen to music that we need to continue to set off for ourselves so that we can have some decompression time. So that's for anybody, whether or not you've got somatic symptom disorder or you're just struggling with some worry that has to do with the illness, or oh, worry that doesn't have to do with the illness, all of those are, are useful. If your anxiety and distress have transitioned over into what would be considered somatic symptom disorder, then you need to start adding on. Um, and the add-ons would be therapy as a first treatment. And you would find somebody who does cognitive behavioral therapy or, and grief work and in many cases family therapy because this illness is a family disease not just for the people who have the hereditary form even if you have just one major. It affects everybody in your family. And then there are medication options for anxiety. They're not tranquilizers. Tranquilizers are not what people use for chronic anxiety. We use an antidepressant because it, it works in the same um, chemicals and chemicals that <clears throat> are involved in anxiety. And the ones that are most often used are the SSRIs like Zoloft and Lexapro. And if you use the two of them together, that's probably the best thing. The second bucket is the one you've all heard of, P PTSD. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and we associate that usually with vets who have been through wartime. So um, we may associate it with accident survivors, rape survivors, um, trauma survivors of all kinds. This is trauma, and there are people that I know, and I think I at certain points have qualified for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder because of what's happened as a result of the illness. Um, it is a complicated disorder, and so I'm going to, and I don't want to bore you, but in order to qualify to have PTSD, it's not just that you have a flashback, which is kind of what the, um, the popular culture idea of it is. There's a whole bunch of things that need to have, have been experienced by you or that need to be being expressed by you in order to, to qualify. So, you have to have been exposed to an actual or threatened death or serious injury, either by directly experiencing it or by witnessing it, or by learning that it occurred to a close family member or friend, or by being a first responder is usually the, the situation here where you're experiencing repeated <coughs> or extreme exposure to a burst of details of traumatic events. Although, if you have a child who's being hospitalized, very often, then that might put you in that care category too. If you're a board, if you have, if you're the caregiver for a spouse who's in the hospital and you're seeing the drains and the tubes and the leads and all of that crap, and you're dealing with wound care and you know whatever, that can put you into the same category as a first responder. And then you have to have some symptoms. <laughs> The first one that you have to have is some kind of intrusion symptom, which means something is happening to you um, that is out of your control. It's either in the form of a memory that's just coming in real fast of something horrible, 
um, of dreams that are happening in the night that are nightmares and are distressing. Flashbacks where all of a sudden you feel like you're reliving um, and it's out of your control. Having um, distress at any human specific smell that reminds you of whatever that horrible thing was. Um, or uh, having some physiological reaction like um, feeling like a brain freeze or um, just having a horrible um, chest explosion ex feeling experience of um, when, you, when you smell the smell or see the sight or see somebody wearing the same white that you know, the, the nurse wore. Um, you have to have at least one of those, that's the first thing, in order to start qualifying for a PTSD diagnosis. And then you have to have a negative impact on either the way you're thinking or on the way you're feeling. So you may have some amnesia for what happened. Um, you may have uh, negative beliefs or expectations about yourself or support the world. You might have persistent distorted cognitions about the cause of the event. So it was my fault that we didn't catch that bleed soon enough and therefore there was more disability than um, perhaps could have been otherwise. Um, or it was my husband's fault that we didn't take my baby to the hospital sooner. Um, and that's when my baby is in some cases that might actually be reality. But um, if it's distorted, then it can qualify you for this. And you have to have two of these. Um, a persistent negative emotional state, fear, horror, anger, guilt, or shame, it's not wanting to participate in your significant activities that you have been before, feeling detached or estranged from other people, and having an inability to experience positive emotions. So not necessarily feeling sad, but feeling flat. Um, that, that can put you in that category of negative impact. Persistent avoidance of the stimuli associated with the traumatic event um, is another criteria. So you have to not want to touch it, not want to go near it. And in a lot of cases, that might be avoiding medical care that you might otherwise need because you just don't want to deal with it. Um, but it can also mean um, not wanting to deal with the feelings. Not uh, um, okay. I, I mean, it's, it's self disclosure here. When my daughter was, um, I'll tell you my story. Um, so I was a, a, a mom, an older mom of an older child. My baby was four months old when um, she started becoming more and more irritable, and I didn't know whether to take that seriously, whether it was teething, whether it was just the beginnings of some common illness or what, but it kept getting worse and she kept crying more and more of the time over the course of the week. And then she got to the point where she would cry and then when she stopped crying she would just flop um, into sleep is what I thought it was. Um, and I took her to the pediatrician after a week and the pediatrician said, don't know. Don't know what's wrong with her. Can't see anything wrong. Here's some amoxicillin. Maybe she's got a little ear infection. But her fontanelle is raised, which I don't know if it's normal for her, but maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Come back in a week and we'll measure it again. The next morning, I called the, the pediatrician back and I said, Look, I give, I'm trying to give her this amoxicillin, but everything I put in her is just shooting across the room. She's vomiting, you know, and it's, it's going. And he said, Oh, well, I need you to drive an hour and take her to the Children's Hospital and go directly to radiology because I think you need to have her scan. And I'm still going to scan for what? For the flu? She's coming up. Um, because I'm surprised. Um, <laughs> and so we, I got my husband and we drove the hour and they brought us into radiology. And again, still sitting there thinking that my daughter had the flu, the radiologist came out after the cat scan and said, your daughter's brain is full of tumors. And for me, that is the moment 
that I think captures the, the PTSD experience. It was a very long time where that moment would only trigger in the heart. That's the one feeling of hearing those words, your daughter's brain is full of tumors. I, I will always remember this man. I will always remember what he looks like. But for a long time when I saw tall men with white coats, Seeing the Steve Miller, I couldn't even listen to the Steve Miller anymore. <laughs> <laughs> for a while, without thinking of this moment, I guess still every once in a while it gets. But it's just that little, that small of a thing, that big of an impact. Um, and then that, of course, went on to, and if sh there's so many of them, and one of them is hemorrhaging, and if we don't get it out today, she's going to die. And so then I have a four month old. Um, going into surgery to save her life and coming out with, you know, a drain coming out of her brain, of her skull. I, I was medically naive and I had my first medical baby experience being a drain coming out of a, a child's skull and all the tubes and all of that other stuff. Um, it was, it was horrifying. Um, and I didn't realize how horrified I was until the second surgery. And then it all came out. And then that's when that's when I went into therapy, um, because every single memory from the first time I was there, in addition to all of the trauma that was still happening the second time. Um, so for these types of illnesses, they get compounded. It isn't every time I walk my daughter into the hospital like the first time. It's like this time plus every time behind it. Um, so. Julie has had four brain surgeries. Were she to have a fifth surgery, it would be the fifth surgery in my mind, in my heart, plus the four behind it, which can only be horrifying. There's no way that that can't be horrifying. It's just a matter of figuring out how to manage the horror of that. Um, so getting back to this, arousal and the activity, <clears throat> irritable behaviors and empty outbursts, we all know about uh, the stories of Vets that kind of go off the wall and um, are, are easily provoked into some kind of violence, but it isn't just vet experiences that can be there. Uh, reckless or self destructive behavior, so, and, and that includes drinking too much, um, spending too much, a, a lot of the things that you think of that they go with that. Hypervigilance, um, that's can be hypervigilance of your symptoms <coughs> over your kid, an exaggerated startle response, problems with concentration, I think we've all been there, and sleep disturbance. So I have an example here of a child with PTSD. What PTSD can look like in a child can be attention deficit disorder, oppositional defiant disorders, what OGD is, school refusal, all of those things might indeed be actually symptoms of some kind of PTSD. So Emma is an eight-year-old who had a significant hemorrhage while at school. She had surgery to remove a brainstem lesion, followed by inpatient rehab, which completely disrupted her school year. Um, she was diagnosed with multiple lesions. Her friends disappeared. They didn't know how to manage it. A friend who had brain surgery. I think it's it's pretty common for kids to be considered weird if they have an illness. And something as big as um, brain trauma can, can really stretch childhood friendships. Perhaps they weren't as secure as they could be already begin with. Um, her parents were traumatized and hypervigilant, as we all tend to get. Um, when Emma returned to school the following year, she was distracted. And so people were going, oh, well, she had brain surgery, so of course she's going to be distracted. But this wasn't necessarily because of the brain surgery. She was oppositional with her teachers um, and hypersensitive, hypersensitive to any time that they tried to correct her, even in academic mistakes, math problems that she got wrong. No, I got that right. You're wrong. Um, irritable with her old friends. Um, her artwork and pretend play were full of violent images, some blood, just so you know, you can tell there was something more going on. Um, she had meltdowns at doctor's appointments, and eventually she had meltdowns before school. And by meltdowns, it's violent, um, hitting mom, screaming, 
um, trying to get away, or somebody was just being combative. Um, and she was terrified that going to school would cause another image. And that is the harm was what was going on underneath there. She was terrified that going to school would cause another image. But what the teachers were seeing was not that. What the teachers were seeing were, was a kid who was not paying attention, who was pissed off at them all the time, and who was not doing well socially. So helping a child get to a place of being able to deal with the trauma is, is another huge challenge in that it first needs to be recognized because they can't verbalize it. I can say, oh my God, when this happened to me, I felt um, <clears throat> a child doesn't necessarily have the capacity to do that. Um, for PTSD, therapy is not an option. PTSD is clinically significant enough and life altering enough that it requires treatment. You can't meditate your way out of PTSD. It's just not going to work. Um, so there are a number of different therapy techniques that are used, and I, I don't really need to describe them. The one that's got initials in the MDR that stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. Yes, I think so. In which you're kind of going back over the traumatic event while a therapist is doing some eye movement treatment. For some reason, that seems to help in reprocessing the events themselves. Um, for kids, play therapy, child-adapted stress inoculation therapy, and stress management training are really good. Um, I heard the other day that, this is weird, but if you play video games as you are thinking about whatever just happened, you do it within a 24 hour of a traumatic event, but that can prevent PTSD. So if you know that your kid has just been through a particularly traumatic medical procedure, let them play. Let them play for a little while. It's, it's okay. If, if, especially if they're playing while you're talking to them a little bit on the side about that. Is really um, what was that like for you in the new um, But they're going to have to think about it a little bit while it is that they're playing, and again, for whatever reason, in the, in the study that they, they talked about Tetris, and this is not about Tetris, but I have a feeling it's pretty much any video game that's going to keep you um, distracted and out there. And then medication is available to help with PTSD, it doesn't cure it, but it helps, and again, it's the antidepressants, the SSRIs, and then there's a different kind of antidepressant called the SNRI. Um, and then they also have heart medicine called Prazosin, if it's a calcium channel blocker, it can help with sleep disruption, with the, with the um, sleep night terrors that helps with PTSD can sometimes get. Are there questions? Is there anything that I can help with or anyone want to share anything? Just trace me. I think, you know, again, I just want to repeat, it's normal to worry. Please don't feel like you, you're going crazy because you're really anxious. That's what you um, Yeah, Michelle. Could you explain the difference between being vigilant and being hyper-vigilant? Because I imagine there's a lot of parents here really wondering where, where do we go into crazy and where are we um, I think there's a point, especially when, you know, there's a number of us, including me, who've been dealing with this for a long time. And I think there's a batting average that starts to accumulate in the beginning. Vigilant and hypervigilant are, hypervigilant is fine, because you don't know. But over time, if you've still got that level of vigilance in your down the road since the last village, then that's probably <coughs> overdoing it and into hypervigilance. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it's not it's not that hypervigilance is inappropriate at the beginning. It is appropriate at the beginning. Um, it's just not appropriate always forever. Well, thank you, and...